Washington Pod presents Earl Nightingale. To ask, what is the role of attitude in a person's success or failure? is much like asking, what is the role of granite in the Himalayas? Or what is the role of H2O in the Pacific Ocean? Attitude comes very close to being everything about success or failure. With a great attitude, a person can succeed, though he may start with very little else. Attitude makes the sale, or loses it. What is attitude? The dictionary describes it as a matter of bearing or mood. But it's much more than that. Attitude is what sets the stage for what we want or expect to happen. The person who goes through life, as millions do, saying, with my luck, the whole thing will go down the toilet, goes down the toilet over and over and over and over again. His attitude sets the stage for failure. He or she expects failure. He or she thinks about failing, and he or she fails over and over and over and over again. A person can have a great education, but if he also has a poor attitude, he will almost certainly fail. The attitude that demands excellence always results in excellence. You and I can see to it that we maintain an attitude of great expectations. It's more fun and so much more interesting to adopt and keep such an attitude, and it always results in our reaching new levels of achievement. We're not born with a drive for excellence in our lives and work. Those are qualities that come from learning or experience or both. But we're born with exuberance and curiosity, and when these qualities are combined with great expectations, we can expect marvelous results. We try harder. We put more of ourselves into what we do when we have an attitude of great expectations. That's good enough, won't do, not for a moment. An expectant attitude, an attitude that expects good things to happen, that expects success, seems to have an uncanny way of shaping future events and bringing together the most astonishing coincidences. The right people show up at the right time, and suddenly other people around us are infected by our ideas and spirit. Their morale goes up. They're as infected with the idea of excellence and success as we are. A great attitude is marvelously infectious. It can spread throughout an entire company or organization. If there are great attitudes at the top of an organization, there will be great attitudes throughout the organization. Everyone begins putting more of himself and herself into the effort. An American woman was once so impressed by the ragu at a fine restaurant in Paris, she asked the chef if he would give her the recipe. He was happy to comply, and he did so. A couple of years later, back in the same restaurant in Paris, the woman chided the chef about not giving her the complete recipe for the ragu. It doesn't taste as good as yours, she told him. The chef went over the recipe again with her, and when she told him that she had followed it to the letter, he looked at her for a long moment, searchingly, and then said, Madam, perhaps you left out the most important ingredient of all. Perhaps you forgot to throw yourself into the ragu. Our true attitude toward something has a palpable effect on those about us. It can even affect animals. A horse, for example, is affected by the attitude of its rider and will often react accordingly. It's as though we send out an aura of vibrations which are picked up by sensitive creatures about us. Women tend to be particularly susceptible to the auras or radiations of others. They feel good about a person, or they feel nervous and ill at ease, even suspicious. Most husbands have at one time or another experienced their wives saying to them after having met someone, I don't trust that person, there's something fishy about him. And their appraisal is often later confirmed. Many times over the years I've found myself over-tipping the waiter or waitress who has a good attitude about doing his or her job. A friendly, happy, positive attitude often makes up for so-so food or other mistakes that might, had the attitude been average or poor, ruined a dinner. People who serve the public and depend upon tips for a part of their income can often double their tip income by simply improving their attitudes. They'll also cut down on the number of complaints. It's a fact of life that the great majority of people begin their days in a kind of neutral as far as attitude is concerned, and depend upon whatever stimuli they encounter to set the attitude tone for them. If things go well, 
and it's a beautiful day, their attitude may be fine. If things go wrong, or it's cold and raining, their attitude will reflect that also. Not understanding the importance of a great attitude, and what it can mean to us, they put their attitudes in the hands of others or the elements and live accordingly. It's a reactive kind of life, not a very satisfactory sort of existence. I recall the day that the American hostages, held for so many months in Iran, were returned to the United States. The looks on their faces, the way many of them kissed the tarmac upon disembarking from the plane. Blessed freedom, just to be home again. As Mr. Levin, the correspondent who escaped after eleven months of captivity, shouted upon his return, I'm a born-again American. How sweet it is after it's been taken away for a time, and yet how many millions of us take our days for granted and go about them grudgingly, defensively, with the attitude that says, Do unto others before they can do unto you. Thousands of people, upon discovering what a change in attitude can mean for them, actually do become born-again Americans or born-again Canadians or born-again whatever nationality they happen to be, because there's no fragment of this freedom of ours that cannot be turned into the success we seek. There are no jobs so humble that they do not have hidden within them the opportunity for greatness and all the success we could possibly want. But it takes an expectant attitude to see it. That kind of attitude draws back the curtains of ordinariness that tend to cloak the work of the majority in common, everyday raiment, and exposes the possibilities within. You know, you and I are on a kind of holiday on earth. Out of the mystery we appear to share our lives with the other living things on this small, blue, blessed planet. We spend a time here before merging back into the mystery once again. During this time, let us enjoy ourselves to the fullest. To do that, we need to, as wise old Socrates admonished us, examine ourselves and discover what we're best equipped to give for the journey's fare. There's really no good excuse for not doing that which we most want to do, nor for not enjoying to the fullest those experiences we find to our liking. They make the holiday all the more interesting and rewarding. Being on this holiday, there are few times that warrant genuine sadness, unless we take upon our shoulders the problems and miseries of the entire world, and that's futile. We need only brighten the corner where we are, to the very best of our abilities. That's our part of the bargain. To give it our best during the time we dedicate to service, and the rest we can enjoy with those we love and with whom we share our lives.